In today's video, I'm gonna walk you through how to get a good night's sleep. My name's Ollie, and after working with thousands of clients with the Body Reset program, we've started to uncover how much sleep has such a big impact on your nutrition, your training, your overall body composition, and how you feel on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you missed this part, you're gonna notice that you're really finding it hard to make your body shift or feeling good in the process. So today is not gonna be a conversation about why sleep is important, but more importantly, what tactical steps you can take depending on what part of sleep you really struggle with. What I mean by that is there's a quantity aspect we all know that we need seven or eight hours a night but it's understanding how to get better quality are we having trouble getting to sleep staying asleep or are we waking up a lot during the night and then not being able to get back to sleep i'm going to walk through all three parts of those really break it down a lot more and understand that there's key reasons why you're waking up at certain parts of the night i'm going to walk you through all of that as well so let's dive in and let's get your sleep better Hey all, uh, lovely to have you on the call today. This is a sleep training and I want to dive into more of the tactical action steps around sleep. If you're someone who struggles getting to st sleep, staying asleep or when wakes up can't get back to sleep. Uh, those are three key categories that we see come through really commonly and those are three key categories that I'd like to dive into today with you. So uh, before we do, uh, I'd love to know who's joining us. There was a lot of interest both on Instagram and Facebook to this. So we're doing this inside the group to really walk through all of this for you guys. Really make sure that if it's an area you struggle with, I really want to make sure it's not. And uh, addressing sleep is an area that I think commonly is really misunderstood or, or unknown. Unless you're going in for a specialist appointment to get a nap, sleep app machine, there really seems very little evidence or very little uh, help around this area. And it is a very complicated topic. It ties in quite closely to nutrition. It ties quite closely into stress and how you're coping through your day. Light exposure, hormone status, digestion, so many other areas that I want to really simplify down as much as possible today. So if you've got any questions, if there's any area of this you'd really like me to spend some time on, can you just comment below one quick question? What is something I could actually answer for you on today's call? Uh, this is live, so I do want to keep this a little bit more interactive and just make sure there's an area or focus if I can dive into that for you that'd be awesome too uh, it seems that we've got a couple of people on the call um, Trish lovely to have you on and we've got um, a couple of people rolling on in so uh, as I'm waiting for a couple more people one thing I'll, I'll uh, mention that just arrived in the mail yesterday that I've been sharing with everyone is this little uh, it's essentially a Chinese medicine uh, clock which gives you an awareness of what time of day certain organs are working so you get an awareness of between that one to three time, there's a lot of liver function. Between three and five, more bladder, large intestine, stomach, spleen, etc. And there's a uh, nighttime version of this or AM of this and a PM of it, which is quite interesting. And there's a lot of areas in there. And what I want to do is really simplify that down into what we see more regularly and what I feel are the three main areas that will be most uh, important or most helpful to really know okay so there are components of this that do tie right back into traditional Chinese medicine but really understanding what we see in the real world and how we can actually apply this to what's happening for you and how we can make some tweaks and adjustments from there okay so uh, if we're ready to dive in let's bring this up so like I mentioned it's going to be very much more around the tactical steps of this and how we can really address some of those issues coming through so the first one is going to be falling asleep if you really struggle with getting to sleep uh, potentially you you actually feel tired but you feel sort of tired but wired your body won't really won't calm down or you just can't quite get to sleep and you're getting familiar with the ce ceiling i think a big part of this really comes down to the mental chatter element and this is the first one we really want to address if you're someone who's got a quite stressful day or you find that you just have a really busy mind maybe you've had a really calm day but when you get to nighttime your body just ramps up and starts thinking about everything really really important to look at protecting some level of routine in the afternoon and this is probably the more, most boring of the three <laughs> but is also the most important right nothing fancy works unless you nail the basics so looking at this through the lens of some level of routine where you're looking at a meditation a breath work component one thing i always emphasize here is this doesn't have to be two hours on a mountaintop this can simply be five to ten breaths at the end of the day just sitting on the end of the bed you could look at journaling and brain, brain, some sort of brain dump or getting you those ideas out of your head i think can be fantastic or going deeper and really going down some level of gratefulness or um, journaling path i think is really really helpful if you call it a tactical note list 
list, a uh, journal, a diary, whatever works for you, just taking the time to get those thoughts out of your head, whether it's more wrapping around certain emotional events or making sense of things, or whether it's getting really those ideas and lots of to-dos out of your head so you can look at it the following day. I think really, really important to look at those areas and just taking the time to look at something to wind down. Is it a, a certain calming herbal tea? Is it a bath? Is it reading something? I think all of those areas are really beneficial. And one of the things that we really want to get away from is a lot of that screen time as well, right? So we're really addressing blue light exposure, artificial lights at the end of the day, telling our brain that it's still a t you know, a time to be awake. Um, so if you do have you know, TVs in your bedroom or you're reading late on an iPad, those are the things get, that can really, really impact your quality of sleep because your body still thinks it's midday. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. The second one that we dive into, this was the little uh, chart that I showed you before, right? This is the exact one that came through, but I do want to really simplify this down into three key areas. So staying asleep is really the area that I want to focus on today and seem to be the main interest point. Okay, sleeping all night, every night being the title of today. The first one here that we tend to look at is one to three hours. And this typically we see come through as more of a blood sugar control issue. I'm going to walk you through what I mean by that. If it's more this three to five hours and this obviously there is a bit of overlap here is more a toxicity or liver function aspect so we're going to really dive dive into levels of detoxification or areas of toxins that you may not be aware of and then lastly again a bit of overlap between this four to seven hours tends to be more of a nervous system overdrive really getting to the space where uh, you're waking up feeling sort of quite alert or quite stressed and you certainly can't get back to sleep and you're waking up maybe five hours into the night even if you did have seven or eight hours to sleep we tend to find that many people wake up quite early there as well. So the first one I want to address, this one to three hours. Uh, the first one we really want to look at is what are we eating in that last meal? Now, uh, if you've been around Meta Project and Body Reset uh, for any number of uh, months or years, uh, you'll know we're a big fan of what's called metabolic flexibility, being flex allowing your body to be flexible to use both carbohydrates and fats as fuel, and realizing that there's po points in the day that are beneficial and unhelpful to utilize certain carbohydrates or fats, meaning we tend to find as we get older, our, our requirements for protein and fats start to increase and our carbohydrates are ones that are not bad, but certainly times of day make a really big difference. And I'm being vague because it really depends on the person, their, their uh, body fat levels, their activity levels, etc. But generally having a higher fat base at the start of the day can be a really, really nice way to start, right? So rather than having your, your oats or your muesli or cereal, etc. Etc. Sticking towards more of your protein and fats like your eggs or even your meats, avocados, um, smoothies, etc. can be a really nice shift to make uh, to the morning. And this has a significant impact obviously throughout the day, but also at the end of the day. So coming back to this particular issue, looking at those low glycemic carbs before bed can be a really nice way to calm the nervous system down and provided you're moving adequately in the day I think you're going to utilize those quite well I think there's a there's a worry around storing carbs in the, the day because you're not using them because we only look at carbs as sort of your energy source but realizing that fats can be a very effective energy source and a much more sustained energy source through the day the big differentiation that we need to look at here is low versus high GI carbs, meaning glycemic index. Now, this simply means the level to which it is sort of secreted through the body or released through the body, rather than having like a big spike of sugar from a bag of lollies, right? Or even something like pasta, we're having something more like a sweet potato, a long grain rice, uh, quinoa, something along those lines where it's a lot more sustained over three, four plus hours rather than sort of a short 20 minute spike. Now that has a significant impact on your sleep quality because if you spike up, you come back down and your body will notice that you're waking up within that one to three hour window after falling asleep because you are you have a low in blood sugar and your body wants to eat again, right? It's trying to wake you up to make sure we can feed and, and get our blood sugar back in a stable range. Now this is a bigger topic than today, but really as under, understanding that that undulating of blood sugar through the day is really the cause of so many health conditions coming through, uh, not to mention just really, really bad for your energy, your mood, and your focus through the day. But in this space, you, you from a sleep standpoint, it's going to make a really big difference as well. So minimizing that sugar consumption, especially in the last couple of hours of the day, and really looking towards low glycemic carbs can be super beneficial to getting a good night's sleep. Alongside this, high quality proteins throughout the day should really be a focus, but in the last meal will really allow you to sustain that blood sugar much better. And giving yourself that sweet spot of two, three hours before bed 
tends to really help in giving your body one adequate time to digest the food before bed or making sure we're actually having it close enough. I think most people tend to give themselves you know, four or five hours before bed where they start to see their snacking more often or they're you know eating 30 minutes before bed and we're not taking the time to digest. So that sort of two to three hours, depending on your digestive system and what feels good for you, uh, I think tends to be a nice range. Um, the second one we dive into, so this is the one where we talked about that sort of three to five hour window, right? Maybe we're waking up to pee is quite a common one, right? So if, if this is you, if, if you're one that has to get up to pee during the night and you'll usually find that, hey, if I go to bed by nine or 10 o'clock, I'm usually waking up around one to three, all right? Now, the big part here, and I've mentioned this in posts and emails before, is it's typically not that you have to get up to pee. It's usually a liver function component. Uh, unless there's a, a bladder control thing that we need to address separately, uh, it's usually not because you need to pee. If you Your bladder overall is very resilient, right? And if you have a liter of water before bed, you should actually be able to sleep through the night right up until your 60s, 70s before getting up to pee becomes the issue, okay? So looking at that space and realizing that there's probably something a little bit deeper down is the first thing that we need to be willing to explore because I think most of us are very locked into, well, this is just how it's been for 10 years or five years and it's just because I need to pee. Now, if it is truly that you've had too much water, we can adjust that slightly. Usually it's a, you know, an addition of a little bit extra sodium at the end of the day to actually utilize that water. But again, another conversation another day. The big thing that we're really looking at is that liver toxicity level, okay? So if this is a big thing for you, I think a big one to really address straight away is reducing, reducing the alcohol consumption will actually impact all three of these, right? So uh, the alcohol sugars coming through will impact the one to three hours and also removing the alcohol before bed will have a huge impact on the quality or depth of sleep. But especially from a liver toxicity, clearly this is going to be one where your liver is having to work harder to work through essentially a poison, right? An alcohol that's going through your body and it can last for a couple of days there. The other one that we tend to see come through is the low quality oils and uh, we've done quite a few trainings on understanding vegetable oils and what oils we prefer to cook with. I think many of us tend to get very caught up on the caloric intake of a meal, not necessarily the, the, the toxic intake from a meal. Meaning, if I have a big you know, bowl of chips, right, fries from a, from a restaurant, then I'm gonna get a certain caloric amount, and that's what most people worry about. But what we don't worry about is the toxic intake that we're getting from that meal, which is it's being deep fried in low quality oils, and that's gonna systemically elevate our inflammation for 24, even 48 hours after the meal, right? So it's dis- down-regulating our immune system, It'll usually disrupt our breathing. It's going to really get in the way of our digestion and generally just not very helpful of how that body functions overall, okay? Not to mention that sleep quality. So if we're starting to look at things like deep fried foods and that low quality oil, that's a really, really good one to address alongside alcohol to really just give our body a bit of a break, especially that liver side of things. And then the last one that we're starting to look at here is that nervous system overdrive. And this is a super interesting space that we start to look at. Uh, As I mentioned, that melatonin dropping too early, uh, we've talked about, and hopefully you're uh, aware of some level of circadian rhythm. If you're not, it's something that we can look through really quickly. This was from a previous training we've done. Understanding that through the day, there's a increase in cortisol that's supposed to decline through the day, whereas during the night we get an increase or should get an increase in melatonin coming through. Now, the problem is, is that most of us are chronically stressed through the day or not taking the time to really re- get into that calm, rest and digest state, but that really starts to disrupt that melatonin reduction coming through. Now, if you're not getting a high level of melatonin coming through, then it's going to make a huge difference to your depth and quality of sleep. So if you're someone that's getting the hours of sleep, but you're finding that you're just not getting those that quality or really feeling like you're waking up well rested and restored from the night before, then this is certainly something to address a little bit more. Okay. The other part here is just taking the time to, to address. It usually comes back to that light exposure aspect, right? So two really, really simple parts to look at is are you getting natural lights in the morning, telling the body you're awake, telling getting getting that natural light exposure to wake the cells up is the first part. The second part is how late into the night are you looking at screens? Are you looking at artificial lights? Now, many of us spend 90, 95% of our day under artificial lights, me included, right? But it's intentionally adding natural light in those first hours of the day and then being very mindful of those bright lights and specifically blue lights at the end of the day to really calm down that body is a huge one as well. Uh, And then lastly, again, a big part of this is coming back to controlling uh, your stress levels or overall nervous system, right? And and that autonomic nervous system arousal is an area that I think we need to get much better at regulating for many, many reasons, uh, hormonally, digestively, and especially from sleep. But taking the time to again come back to this journaling, diary, 
uh, brain dump version of just writing things down, I think is a really, really good way to get things out of our head. So we're not waking up in the middle of the night, um, you know, stressed and ready to uh, dive into a new work project. Uh, certainly one that I have uh, experienced before. <laughs> Um, the next one that we look into here is what happens when you're awake. Okay, so if maybe you find that you wake up regularly or when you wake up, you just can't get back to sleep. This is a really simple framework that we tend to use with many, many clients. And I've, I've discussed this with a lot of coaches on their best practices. Uh, the first one tends to always come back to a simple count to 20 breaths, right? Take the time to really just calm the body down, focus in on the breath, because typically your brain is darting around all over the show here and it's taking the time to simply wind down. The second one here is, and this this was actually mentioned by a couple of our coaches and I really, really liked it, was uh, visualizing traveling home from the event you're stuck in. So potentially we uh, wake up in these sort of stress states or we tend to mull over certain arguments or conversations or discussions at, at work or home that were happening. So taking that time to visualize traveling home from that event may look like finishing up that, that conversation or putting down the laptop visualizing getting in the car, driving home, getting ready for bed. That can be a really nice way to just calm your body down and really feel like you've had closure with that conversation. And then lastly, if this still isn't working, a big recommendation here is get out of bed, right? We really, the, the really hard part about waking up during the night is su such a big part of this is that it becomes an ingrained habit. It becomes expected. Now this now shifts away from the biological reason for waking up, right? Getting up to pee, um, the liver function aspect, uh, the nervous system arousal, whatever it might be. And it now becomes an ingrained habit of just feeling like this is just part of how I expect to wake up during the night, right? So getting out of bed, getting used to reading, journaling, meditating, something that just calms your body down, gets it away from whatever's happening until you feel tired enough to feel like you're gonna go back to sleep and then go back to bed is the best way we've found to really look at this through the biological aspect, but also look at it through the habit forming aspect of getting better at feeling as if you're associating the bed with good quality sleep rather than a disturbed night. All right, really, really does make quite a difference. So the last thing I'm gonna leave you on this with today is just understanding the formula, all right? 10 hours before bed, remove the caffeine, right? You might think that you only see that spike or that boost from caffeine for an hour or two, but it's gonna be in your system for 10 hours. Uh, if, it's, if this really is an issue, you need to address your nutrition to make sure your food, sorry, your energy intake through that day is a, is a hell of a lot better. Okay, uh, last meal, about that two to three hours before bed. As soon as we get to that two hours, if you haven't already, stop working, get that brain to slow down. And then one hour before bed, turn off screens so that we're giving ourselves uh, at least an hour to get away from that artificial light and tell the body to calm down. So that's your that's your tea with a book, that's your bath, that's your meditation, that's something along those lines where you're just getting away from the screens will make a really big difference. Okay, so I hope that was beneficial. Just wanna walk you through some of the key components of a stress and sleep conversation that we've had quite regularly with members, as well as a menopause workshop that we're working through this week. I wanted to share with that with you a bit more. If you want access to a downloadable copy of all this and maybe a bit of a deeper dive into uh, understanding circadian rhythm, light exposure, et cetera, that we've gone through, just comment sleep guide below and we'll send that one through. Uh, we've got a full video plus the PDF download that you'll get access to and just really getting an awareness of what that looks like from a improving your sleep standpoint. Like I mentioned at the start, I feel that that's an area that most people just don't feel like there's much information about it and certainly not this sort of tactical, applicable information, not just understanding what happens with sleep cycles and circadian rhythm, but also really taking the time to address what can I actually do in this particular scenario. So hopefully today was helpful, gave you a little bit of an awareness around what part of this you can really address and maybe what's happening a little bit deeper down. So lovely to have you on the call. And uh, I will, like I said, that sleep guide below, Rachel's onto it. And we will send that one through. Yeah, that's me for Thursday. Hope you're having a lovely week so far. Um, we're two days into our menopause workshop that we've been doing this week as well. Uh, this is one key component that we're walking through there. Uh, and if you're not in that group and you're walking through perimenopause or deeper into menopause and you want access to that, please let me know below as well. And we can send that through as well. So hope you're doing great. And uh, we will talk again very soon. See ya. Bye.